Whitney, this is Victor. We don't do much of an introduction. We intend to um, show you instead of tell you that we're pretty cool people, but if you want to know more, that's probably in the GoTo app, right? You can find us, we're around. Um, during this session today, I like that he said, uh, they'll hopefully teach you some interesting stuff. We promise to entertain you at least, yeah? Um, so during this session, we're gonna take an application that's currently source code on a developer's laptop, and we're gonna get it all the way through to a development environment where it's running in a Kubernetes cluster, where it's connected to backing services, and uh, where it can be further developed natively in Kubernetes. And we're gonna do that all within this 50-minute period, and um, we have lots of different system design choices to make along the way. So for those choices, we need your help. So for each step of the way, we're going to um, examine all the possible CNCF projects that can do that step. And I will teach you about them, and then you're going to use this Slido app to vote. And then whatever y'all vote, Victor's going to implement into a live demo. So we're going to do a live demo today with six different system design choices that we're building out in front of you based on your, what you want to see. So please uh, use this QR code and get on the Slido app. The Slido app has um, live question and answer that someone already found in the, while we were sitting around. We're not gonna look at that. My, my phone's off and back there. That's the only way I can see it. I'm not gonna have my phone on stage. So if you have any questions you want to ask to us um, that you're sh too shy to speak out loud, the GoTo app has a Q&A feature, so you can use that. And we'll see those. We'll do a Q&A at the end if there's time. So um, I'm giving everyone a chance to get this code. When I go to the next screen, it's not gonna have it anymore. This is our hero right now. Their hero's form is application source code on a developer's laptop. And where we're gonna move it on forward. Okay, here we go. So our first system design choice is to build a container image. So our application, once it's built into a container image, it's gonna be wrapped up with all of its dependencies as, long, as well as in a lightweight OS. And then that uh, container Im uh, image is portable and it can be run on a system isolated alongside other applications where they, the dependencies don't affect each other. So our first technology that does this in the CNCF landscape that we're gonna talk about is Lima. Now Lima is a VM that's optimized to run Containerd on a Mac. And then Containerd uses a CLI called NerdCuddle. So with NerdCuddle, you can interact, you can build images just like you would uh, with Docker. So the same Docker commands you can use with NerdCuddle. And both Docker and NerdCuddle under the hood are using a technology called BuildKit. But we're talking about it at the Lima level, at the ContainerD level, because those are the CNCF projects that are in the mix. So if those of you are familiar with Docker, um, you're gonna supply that build command, you're gonna give a Docker file, and that Docker file has instructions about how to build your container image. Next up, we have Cloud Native Build Packs. Cloud Native Build Packs, um, what it does is it inputs your application source code and it outputs an OCI compliance container image. OCI stands for Open Container Initiative. So it does this by, it has its own application called a builder that it spins up, and that builder is going to detect what, uh, what language you're using, what the dependencies are, it's gonna create a build plan, and then it's going to check it against any cached uh, layers, and then it's going to build the image for you. Um, what this does is it's a reproducible builds. As an ops person, you can put your best practices in that builder, but then as a developer, when you consume that builder, when you use it, you don't have to worry about those best practices. Um, it also is fast rebuilds because of those cached container layers, like only changed layers need to be rebuilt. And uh, that's, oh, it's fast rebasing. The OS, you can rebase very quickly without having to rebuild the whole image. And then finally, we have Carvel K-Build. With Carvel K-Build, you have your application configuration defined in a YAML, and you let Carvel K-Build know where your application's uh, source code is. And then K-Build can use BuildKit, or it can use uh, build packs, or it can use other container build technologies. And then, um, Basically, when you run the kbuild command, not only does it build that container image, but it also inserts it into your configuration. It tags it, 
puts it into the configuration so you can be sure whatever you're running is definitely the most, the latest version of your source code. And those are our three options. And now, y'all, please vote. Victor, you were going to recap the options. Yeah, so Lima is Docker without Docker, essentially. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to use Docker for one reason, but you like Docker CLI, that's what NerdCuttle gives you, which is part of Lima package I'm using Rancher Desktop today. Cloud Native Build Packs is for people who don't want to use Dockerfile. Kind of, it's scary, right? I, I don't know what's scary about it, but if it's scary, then that's, that's build packs. And Carvel K-Build -build is cool because it automatically modifies your uh, Kubernetes manifests. And Before yeah. we jump forward, I do want to say, if you already are familiar with one of these technologies, don't choose that one because you don't need to see a demo of that. Choose something that's interesting, not necessarily what you think is best. Or if you're not sure, maybe choose the thing that seems really hard so you have to give, cause him a lot of pain. Make me fail. Oh, yes, yes. OK. Uh, that's it. That's uh, it. You need to be faster if you want. Build packs are the winner. Uh, build packs. OK, cool. So what are we going to do? Uh, of what I'm going to do, actually. So uh, I'm going to export an environment variable. I like environment variables. That will be the tag that I'm going to build, 001. Is that big enough text? Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. you don't need glasses or anything? Cool. <laughs> uh, I tend to replace all this uh, to, to keep what I'm doing in a file. Uh, so I'm going to add this to the settings. Not really important. What, that, what is important is that I can execute. So I don't have Docker file or any of the, I mean, I do have it for if you chose the other one. But <laughs> imagine that I don't. Uh, so I'm just going to pretend that there is no Docker file. And I'm just going to say, hey, I want you to build something called CNCF demo <laughs> on this tag. And BuildPux will figure out, by, based on the source code, that this is a Go, Golang application. It figured it out somewhere. Now it is downloading uh, the base images for Go with compiler and all the stuff that my application needs. And uh, it will soon, it started building the application. I mean, not the application. It started building, actually, the binary and stuff like that. And eventually, it will uh, create a container image. That was an easy one. <laughs> make, uh, make it harder next time. <laughs> I think it's there, less. there are actually two choices today that I have no idea how to do, <laughs> uh, honestly. Oh, um, and that reminds me, we do have a pitfall, too, in our Choose Your Own Adventure story. There's one project in the mix that's not a CNCF project. So if you choose that one, we'll all die. Uh, here's the image. There's the image. Built 43 years ago. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, give me back my slides, uh, please. Yeah, here are your slides. <laughs> uh, there we go. Excellent. So now our next choice is to store a container image in a container image registry. A registry is simply a server that's meant to store, uh, to host container images, and it can have a lot of extra features. So our first project we're going to talk about is Docker Hub. Uh, those of you familiar with this space may already be like, aha, that's the one. That's the one that's not CNCF. But under the hood, uh, Docker Hub uses a project called Distribution that is a CNCF project. And what Distribution is, is it's a toolkit to help you build container registries. So it's very popular. Um, GitHub Container Registry uses it. GitLab Container Registry uses it. DigitalOcean Container Registry uses it. And actually, the next choice also uses it. Harbor uses Distribution under the hood. So Harbor is a container image registry with a lot of extra features. So for example, you can um, duplicate your image registry. That could be easy. That could be good for geo-replication, but also good if you want to avoid Docker Hub rate limits. Uh, you could also scan images to make sure they're uh, free of vulnerabilities. You can sign images or tr as trusted or use Harbor to verify that your image that you are using is trusted. Um, it has access policies, so you can make sure only certain people can have access to your registry. And then it also does image retention policy, so it will automatically garbage collect old images for you to free up disk space. And then our third choice is Dragonfly. So all three of these choices can actually coexist because Dragonfly builds on top of Harbor. It can be used in conjunction with Harbor. 
And what Dragonfly is, is it's a peer-to-peer -peer networking system with, uh, for a Kubernetes cluster with the intention of moving images and other large files around the cluster easily. So peer-to-peer -peer networking system, so instead of um, there being one image registry that every computer in your Kubernetes cluster is connected to, now all the computers in your cluster are all connected to each other and the images can be stored across those computers. So in, in addition, uh, Dragonfly has a sub-project called NIDUS, N-Y-D-U-S, which is a different file format. So I talked about OCI, OCI compliance image, a NIDUS image is different, but there are tools that will help you convert your image to and from OCI to NIDUS. But a NIDUS image has two uh, benefits. One is that it can store your container image in lots of different pieces. So in this peer-to-peer -peer network system, it can store your image across on um, different nodes at the same time. And then the other thing it does that's cool is that it knows which pieces of the image are needed to start your container. So it downloads those first and gets your container started ASAP before it downloads the rest of the image. And those are our three container image registry choices. Victor, recap what I just said. How well were you listening? Uh, not at all. <laughs> <I know>. uh, <laughs> Docker Hub based on distribution, commercial SaaS offering uh, based on distribution, hardware also based on distribution, but instead of being SaaS, you self-manage it yourself. And Dragonfly is something, something, I don't know. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that, oh, that's why you're voting for it. <laughs> oh, it's happening. It's a, it's a fun project because it, it, it's really badly translated from Chinese to English. So if you try to go through Dragonfly documentation, you're going to have a lot of fun time. <laughs> All right. But the setup is actually easy, so it's, it's, it's not that hard. Okay, Dragonfly, huh? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Dragonfly, let's go to my terminal again. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to do is a couple of things. First, I'm going to export a couple of uh, variables, and I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to use Docker with Dragonfly, uh, Docker Hub to be more precise. So, Docker Hub will be registry, and Dragonfly will distribute images, and for that, uh, I need, um, I'm going to export image as well, which is going to be uh, my registry uh, and my username and uh, CNCF demo, right? That's where I'm going to store the image that I'm going to push. And I'm already logged into uh, to Docker, but I'm going to run a setup script that will configure everything for Dragonfly, because configuration is boring. Actually, what this is doing right now, it is uh, installing Dragonfly in my cluster uh, using Helm, nothing really special. And uh, once it is installed, if it's working, uh, I expect this demo to fail later, not right now. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, if it's working, then uh, we'll have Dragonfly up and running. And there we go. And now I can actually push the image as I would normally push to Docker Hub. Uh, except that uh, this time Dragonfly will uh, automatically, you will not even see it behind the scenes distribute images across the cluster and nodes and all that stuff, right? So uh, Docker image, I'm going to target first the CNCF demo image to be um, uh, the, the address of my Docker Hub account. There we go. Uh, I tag the image. I always use latest and specific tag uh, and I'm going to push it uh, this is so marvelous when you have code complete in terminal, right? I'm going to push it to uh, Docker Hub in this case. Uh, that will take a few moments. That's the image that I built uh, in the previous section. Uh, ta -ta -ta, it's going to Docker Hub, even though you didn't choose Docker Hub. And uh, now, uh, if I, for example, do something like Docker image pool into my cluster, uh, sorry, in this case in Docker, but the same thing will be happening in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it just pulls it from um, uh, from uh, from what did I want to say? It pulls it from Docker Hub. But if this would be a Kubernetes cluster, and we're going to get there later. Later, uh, that those images that are pulled in any of the nodes will be distributed across the whole cluster, depending on the need of the cluster. Very very cool. Uh, so yeah, that's it. I have my image built, uh, I have the image pushed to Docker Hub, and uh, Dragonfly is doing peer-to-peer. -peer. It will be doing later on when, when I create an application, deploy it uh, between nodes of my cluster. There we go. Excellent. 
So now this is our hero. Our hero's changed form again. Now they're a container registry with a stream of images inside. And the next thing we need to do is write our application configuration. So I'm a relatively new learner, and one thing that tripped me up at the beginning is that application configuration can be called uh, authoring manifests. Um, it can be called uh, defining your application. These all are different ways of saying the same thing, which is um, besides the application code itself, you need to uh, specify a lot of additional details. So the, the different details you need to specify is also vast. So for example, your container update strategy, you might want that might need to be specified or um, sp application specific things like your environment variables or your port number. Um, also, like infrastructure specific things, so your backing services or what cluster you're deploying to, depending on which tag. And then also there's gonna be Kubernetes specific con uh, configuration for our particular use case. So there's a lot, a lot to think about at this step and there are some tools that will help us. The first one we're gonna talk about is Customize. Customize is natively built into Kubernetes for the apply-k command, but it's also, also available as a standalone binary. So it uses a, a strategy called patching. So when you have this configuration, because of all the different things that need to be defined, it's likely to be very, very long. And before Customize existed, there was a problem of I want to deploy the same application in three different environments, say, but only these minor changes need to happen across deploys, but then I'm having to manage all of this configuration for every environment. So with Customize, you have a base configuration and then you define only the changes that are called patches, and little patch files, and then the patches are overlaid onto that base configuration to result in the final YAML that gets deployed to the target environment. So that's customize and that's a patching strategy. The next one I talk about is Helm. Now Helm uses a, a strategy called templating. So with Helm, the, the variables that are likely to change between deploys, there's a placeholder goes in the goes where that is, and then you keep your values in a separate file. And Helm is very cleverly called a values.yaml. So at the very minimum, you'll have your application configuration, which is actually in Helm. You define that in Golang, so you have some um, dynamic ways you can configure your application in the templating. So you, you have your application configuration, you have your values YAML, and then that's wrapped up into what's called a Helm chart. And that's how you would use Helm to configure the application. Next up, we have Carvel YTT. You've seen this Carvel logo before. We, we talked about Carvel KBuild earlier. So Carvel is a suite of um, lots of small, single-purpose DevOps tools. Uh, Thomas here is wearing a Carvel shirt, so if you see him around, be sure <laughs> to ask him about Carvel, not me. Um, so Carvel YTT, YTT stands for YAML Templating Tool. So it uses, uses the patching strategy of Customize, and you can do the templating strategy of Helm, and you can do that all in one tool. So it's also YAML all the time. So it you can still use the dynamic capabilities like you can with the Golang templ templates in Helm, but in uh, YTT, it uses a Pythonic language called Starlark. And that language is incorporated into your configuration in the YAML comments. So it's always YAML and it can always be processed and validated as such. In addition to that, it knows about YAML structures. So uh, manual escaping or keeping track of how many pro times you press tab, you don't need to worry about that when you're working with Carvel YTT. And then finally, we have CD Kates. So CD Kates, you consume just like you would any code library. And what it does is it makes it so you can author um, Kubernetes uh, configuration in your favorite programming language. As long as your favorite programming language is JavaScript, Java, TypeScript, Go, or Python. Python. Yeah, Python. Yeah. Python. Um, so, it has a couple benefits for developers. Besides, you can harness the power of your own code. You know how to write those conditionals and use functions and all the things. All that works. It also offers simplified abstractions. So the Kubernetes uh, that 
the Kubernetes um, objects that you need to define, anything that you don't need to know as a developer has been abstracted away, so it's a very simple interface. And then when you want to, um, then organizationally, best practices can be defined in that CDK's library, so you can be implementing your company's best practices, and, but not actually have to think about that step. And then when you're ready for it to apply that to the cluster, you run a synth command, and then your CDK's code is synthesized into plain Kubernetes YAML. And for an ops person, that's good because policy can be defined at that step, and also that plain Kubernetes YAML can then be applied to any cluster. And those are our choices. Yeah. OK, go. Are you going to recap? Uh, yes, uh, customize. Uh, Overlays essentially pure YAML, and then you say what you want to overwrite. Uh, Helm is a free text templating, uh, just as you would template HTML, but uh, this time applied to, to YAML. Uh, Carvel is like a combination of Helm and uh, Customize. Uh, and CDK is choose your own favorite language and write stuff there. And output it as YAML, right? That's it. Those are the choices. Three, two, one, be fast. OK, CDK. <laughs> Uh, no time. Uh, so, CDK, uh, let's see. What am I going to do first? Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to, like always, I'm going to execute some setup script that will uh, uh, set up everything for me. Uh, CDK, there we go. Um, okay, so if I go to CDK, I already defined, uh, I, I'm not going to start writing. Uh, uh, everything from scratch. I have everything defined, and here I, I like Go, so Go is my language, right? And this is just uh, typical Go. I mean, typical Go, right? Uh, but you just use Go st uh, constructs uh, to define your applications and what's or not. Uh, if you're familiar with the language, I mean, you wouldn't choose this if you don't know how to write in that language, mm -hmm. right? And if you do, then no point me explaining. Uh, what does uh, matter is uh, if I execute CDK, synth uh, output there and validate. It will convert my uh, Go code. The software is currently running. OK, uh, doesn't matter. Ignore the warnings. Uh, what <laughs> does matter is that it converted my Go code into this file. Uh, and uh, if I show you the file, no, what happened here? I don't know. I don't know. That's not what I wanted. Um, there we go. Uh, it created this YAML file, right? So this is pure YAML, no templates, nothing. This is from Go to YAML, and now I can apply this uh, to Kubernetes cluster. Don't do this at home. Never, never, ever, ever, ever do kubectl apply. That's a very bad idea. Use Argo CD or Flux or something like that. I will do kubectl apply, but only because uh, I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. You should put push things in Git, right? So if I go back. And do what I said that I'm not going to do, and that's kubectl namespace. <laughs> He's a parent, too. Can dev. you imagine? Uh, and I'm going to apply whatever is defined in YAML dev. And you will see my application, uh, resources of my application uh, created. Nothing special yet. It will become more complex later. Uh, or no, depending on what you choose. But deployment service ingress. Uh, you know, Kubernetes deployment creates replica sets, replica sets creates pods, and all that stuff. Anyways, uh, that's that's it. That's it. Uh, I have my application defined, and I have it uh, applied to the cluster. Hey, there is one more thing. Yes, uh, let me double check that it works in the first place. <laughs> that's often the problem. There we go. This is a very complex application. This is this is the. No, no, seriously, this is the most complex Hello World application you see because it uses a database behind the scenes. <laughs> I bet you never saw Hello World that, that outputs Hello World from a database. So it's a complex uh, Hello World application. Now, now back to Whitney. There we go. Uh, next choice. All right. I already said what's going to be the next yeah, choice. Yeah, speaking, uh, yeah, spoiler alert. So this is our hero now. Our hero now is YAML. I've never seen YAML look so happy, for sure. Uh, it references that our registry that we, we're, we've YAML about. looks happy. People writing YAML not <laughs> happy. That's, that's the difference. That's the <laughs> so it references our registry and our images that we've already built leading up to this point. And now we want to add a database to our Kubernetes um, environment, or, or the, at least that our application can access. So we have two very different strategies for this. 
The first one is using a technology we're now already familiar with, Helm. But before I talked about it in the context of authoring your own manifest or defining your own application or writing your own configuration, um, in this context, I want to talk about it as um, a package manager for Kubernetes. So often, if you're going to consume any sort of Kubernetes anything, um, you're going to uh, you download a Helm chart and run that Helm chart. In fact, you did that with Dragonfly just now. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, um, so. We can do that now. If you choose Helm, we're going to download a PostgreSQL Helm chart and apply that and have uh, our database running in our Kubernetes cluster. The other choice is Crossplane. Um, at its core, what Crossplane does is it makes it so that you can interact with any API in the world, yeah, through with uh, make it interact with Kubernetes. So you can bring it into your cluster as a Kubernetes resource. So this is most commonly done with cloud providers and then those um, integrations have already been written. If you want to make it interact with a, an API that's very obscure, you might have to write the integration yourself, but you can do it. Um, with Crossplane, uh, being able to bring that API into your Kubernetes cluster has a couple of benefits. One is that you can use the control loop that's part of Kubernetes to make sure that your external resources stay in the state that you define them to be in in Crossplane. Um, the second big benefit is that you can use any of the tools then that are in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Now you can use those tools not only for Kubernetes resources, but now you can use them with resources outside of your cluster altogether. So a great example of that is what Victor kind of touched on is GitOps. So with GitOps, you could use Argo, a, a GitOps tool like Argo, CD, or Flux. So you have your the state of your external resource defined in Git. You use um, Argo, CD, or Flux to get uh, synced up with your cluster, and then your Kubern your cross-plane resource has the current definition of what you want your external re resources to be, and then cross-plane makes sure those ex external resources are synced up then with the state you defined in Git. So those are our choices today. Okay, short explanation. We have no time, so vote fast. Uh, <laughs> Do we? If you choose Helm, we are going to I'm going to use Helm to run database inside the same cluster. If you choose Crossplane, it could be anywhere, and in this case, it will be in Google Cloud because uh, I did not really set it up to use any possible variation that you could choose. So, uh, Crossplane will be Google Cloud. Uh, Helm will be in the same cluster, and if you don't choose Crossplane, I will get fired from the company where I work. So, choose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, three, two, one. Cool. Crossplane. Uh, okay. So, crossplane it is. Um, let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Uh, what am I going to do first? Uh, what did we choose uh, to define application? Syndicates. Syndicates. Okay. Uh, it becomes complicated with time. Uh, anyways, uh, let me go to syndicates um, directory. So, I already have. Uh, uh, where is it? Uh, ta, 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 ta. Let me see, let me see. Where did I define it? Okay, cut DB. There we go. Uh, this is where I define DB since you chose CDK it's in Go. Uh, this is essentially using. Um, uh, I download uh, the cool thing about CDK is you can actually convert custom resource definitions, which in this case is crossplane into libraries and use it in this case in Go or Python or whatever you're using. So I'm just I just did that and I defined my database that will be running wherever, but in this case implementation will be in um, uh, in Google Cloud. I'm going to define environment variable uh, environment uh, set to dev because my Go code already understands that. Um, and I'm going to say that db.enable. So what I'm using is uh, I'm changing the values in some files so that CDK knows, reads those values, and outputs one thing or another. And in this case, it's going to be, uh, there we go, and I'm going to output that to up uh, dev YAML. Okay, cool. And uh, there is one more thing that I forgot to put. I'm almost getting to the really important Type. I'm going to set it unsecure to true because I did not set uh, the TLS uh, for my cluster, and that is in uh, app dev YAML. Uh, there we go. Okay, this this was just clean up. What does matter here is CDK synth. So same command as before. I'm going to convert my Go code into new YAML, and this time 
that YAML will contain uh, more stuff than before, and that more stuff is this SQL claim that defines the database. Crossplane has something called composition that allows you to group different resources, so I'll create a new service for developers. We have no time, so I'm not going to tell you more about it. What does matter is that I can do kubectl apply, da -da -da -da, uh, and it will, uh, you see, deployment is from before, and, uh, but it was now changed because it will use the secret that will be generated by Crossplane to connect to the database, service from before, ingress from before, database which is SQL claim, and a secret that contains password uh, that will be applied to that database. And now if I say uh, get SQL claims, you will see that database is being created. It is synchronized, but not yet ready. It takes five minutes. No time to wait for that. Uh, what does matter is uh, I'm going to uh, output uh, cube cuttle. There we go. Uh, we go to the next choice, and I'm going to come back to the, uh, to the database because it takes five minutes to, to create it in Google Cloud. If you chose Helm, it would be almost instant. So your problem. <laughs> Go. So, uh, since we have a little time right now, I think we it's don't have time. <laughs> I we think, don't uh, have any time. I'm gonna. I'm going to demystify Victor a little bit and say that he has this iPad here next to him that has all the commands. I'm just copying following. and pasting. <laughs> he is. But um, you can copy and paste too. So this is a, a CNCF demo repo that we have on GitHub. Um, those of you using the Slido app and the menu on there, you can, you can click the menu and you'll see um, the CNCF demo GitHub repo in addition to some other links. We also host a streaming show together called You Choose, which is basically this, but in a much longer format. So for each system design choice, so this is, represents chapter one of our show. Uh, for each system design choice, we'll have a guest come on from each project. So sometimes that guest is a maintainer, sometimes a, an advocate, sometimes a super user, and the guest gets five minutes to present about their project. So very short on purpose, because what they want to do is tell us about all the latest features and bells and whistles. And what we need to know is just basically, please, just what it does. <laughs> please just tell me the minimum. So, um, so they come on, they present about their tech, and then we give a chance for people to vote. And then whatever the winning tech is gets implemented at the beginning of the next episode. So the voting period lasts more like three or four days for that one instead of three or four seconds in this one. Uh, so that's a, a show that we host. And now I'm going to move on and tell you about the next system design choice. So now our hero, Happy YAML, has a, a database cat as a sidekick that's also defined in a YAML file. And these are one-to-one, -one, so they're going to be packaged up into the same um, application. But we can't use the database yet because the database has no schema. And we do have some CNCF projects for that. So the first one is Schema Hero. Schema Hero, um, with Schema Hero, you can define your schema in a declarative and a language agnostic way. And more importantly, you can uh, define it as a Kubernetes resource. So now again, we can use that Kubernetes control loop to make sure the state that you define in your YAML, in your schema YAML, <coughs> is the state that actually exists in your cluster. <coughs> And so what happens when you do that definition is it's going to generate DDL for you. DDL stands for Data Definition Language. That'll show you how your schema is going to change. And then you can run policy on that DDL before you apply it to your cluster. But sometimes, if your data is more sensitive, that might not be enough. So we have another technology, Liquibase. So with Liquibase, it also can be declarative, but instead of declaring only your final state, you can declare different, um, different states along the way to shape how your data gets from one place to another place. The difference is uh, Liquibase is not Kubernetes specific, so it's not def the declarative definition is not a Kubernetes resource, but it is a m more mature technology. Yes. Yeah. And those are our choices. Should we yeah. vote? Choose. Yeah, go. Schema Hero defines as Kubernetes, Liquibase is not as Kubernetes. That's, that's Say it summary. again. Say it again. I didn't hear Schema Hero defines as Kubernetes resource, Liquibase is not as Kubernetes resource. That's, not as a that's Kubernetes the, resource. That's the gist of it, right? Yeah. And uh, you're choosing three. Two, one. So liquid. <laughs> there we go. Uh, you killed Whitney. Uh, it's not. That's that's the only not liquid CNCF project we have uh, in the list. <laughs> Wrong choice. 
Right. I'm not okay. saying it's a bad choice, like for business school, but it's not one of the, it's not in CNCF foundation. So it's not going to be liquid base. It's going to be, um, uh, it's going to be well, schema, schema hero. hero. Yes, yes. And uh, while waiting for that, so this is what was happening when I created uh, the database uh, with Crossplane. Basically, what I got when I created that SQL claim, which is a composition, uh, I got the resources I needed, meaning database instance will be, and it is already created in Google Cloud. Uh, database was created inside of that server. User was added to that uh, database. And uh, the secret with, uh, uh, with uh, credentials to the database should have been created. This is output from before. By now, it was probably created. And I'm going to double check whether that's really true. Uh, videos, if I send the request. Uh, OK, yeah. So this error is good, because it means that actually did connect to the database, but there is no schema. So my application is now connected to the database running in Google Cloud. And I need to apply schema. And you chose, you didn't choose, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could have chosen schema hero, but it's imposed on you anyways. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm going to install Schema Hero right now in a cluster. There we go. Uh, it is installed, or it will be. Since you you, you chose CDK, uh, I'm going to go back to CDK. Um, and uh, I'm going to just uh, skip showing you the file, because it's Go, and I know that you don't like Go. You're scared of it. That's why you use Python. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm just going to change the value uh, Schema Hero enabled so that my code knows. And I'm going to synch synthesize it again. And now you will see an output um, that uh, I have schema. There we go, right? So now my, uh, apart from everything that I had before, uh, I have defined the schema da hero database, which essentially says, get the credentials from a secret so that you know how to connect to the database. And that secret was created already by me, for me, by me, uh, no, for me, uh, by Crossplane. And there is a define a table. Uh, called the videos, and it's going to have two fields only, uh, ID and uh, title, right? OK, cool. So if I go back now, and kubectl uh, 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 namespace is dev uh, apply. If I apply the same manifest, I mean, it's not the same now. It was modified um, uh, by CDK. I should get schema. Created. There we go. Database that is connection uh, from schema hero to the database and the table uh, as Kubernetes resources. And now, if I send the same request to my application, wait, this is too low. Here we go. Uh, I should. I'm not getting an error. That's cool. Null means no data yet. Um, uh, so I'm going to send another request. X post. I'm going to just kind of send something to the application, which will store it in a database uh, to prove that it works. And then if I uh, retrieve, uh, ask the application to retrieve data from the database, there we go, right? Uh, just proving that it's working, it's connected to the database, and all the jazz, all the good things. And now we have the last choice. And uh, be fast, Whitney. What are you waiting for? Why are you trying Is to somebody rush distracting me? We have plenty you? of time. <laughs> <laughs> Stop and smell the roses, Victor. <laughs> so uh, now it's time finally to develop our application. So in this case, what we want to do is be able to develop our application where our application is running in a Kubernetes cluster, but we want to de be able to develop it in something close to real time, get fast feedback. We don't want to have to rebuild our container image and go through a whole CI CD process to just see the changes that we just made. So we have some tools for that. The first one is telepresence. So with telepresence, you install a daemon on your computer, and then you also install a traffic manager in your remote cluster. And that opens up a tunnel between them, and you can interact with all of the services running in your remote Kubernetes cluster as though your laptop is sitting in that cluster. Or maybe the cluster is coming down to you and your laptop. Oops. Haha. <laughs> and so, um, then you can run a telepresence intercept command. It gets better. And then the traffic that, com that comes in 
through the ingress or through that tunnel that comes to the application that's running in the cluster, that traffic will get redirected and sent to a local copy of the application that's running on your computer. And so not only can you interact with everything remotely, but then you can also get real traffic through to your, um, to your local application. So that is telepresence. They call it remote. Next is DevSpace. So with DevSpace, we have a declarative DevSpace YAML that defines what you want your development environment to be like. And then you can run um, dev space dev, I believe is the command. So generally on your team, you're gonna have a Kubernetes expert who does all the work of setting this up. Then as a developer to, to consume this, it's meant to make Kubernetes invisible to the developer. So to consume this, you run dev space dev. So it will, it knows what container images you need. So it might be not only your application that you're developing, but other supporting applications. So it's gonna build those, push them, um, build a cluster if it's not already there, the one that you've defined. It'll um, bring up all the backing services, and then poof, you can develop your application as though um, in this Kubernetes cluster. Uh, with DevSpace, you don't need um, any client running in the Kubernetes cluster like you do with Telepresence. You connect to it with a cube config file like you would connect to most Kubernetes clusters, any Kubernetes cluster that you interact with. And then, um, you can also have that fast feedback experience, which it does through a file syncing mechanism that I don't understand. Next, we have devfile.io. So I'd say DevSpace is the more dominant tool in this, like widely used tool in this space, but there are other companies trying to also make tools that are used in this space, and those companies have joined together to make a specification called DevFile for how you should define a development environment, a cloud development environment. It's not necessarily Kubernetes specific like DevSpace is. So companies who do this, uh, Red Hat has one, uh, AWS has one, JetBrains has one. <clears throat> And um, there's also, if you choose it today, we'll implement it with a tool called Odo, Odo. I don't know how, I've only ever read it, so I don't know if you say Odo or Odo. It doesn't Nobody matter. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Somebody, somebody knows. It's also translated from Chinese. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and so that's dev file. It's a specification, so it's not an implementation. There are lots of tools that can implement a dev file. Um, one advantage of dev file then is that it's tool agnostic. So if you wanted to switch up which tool you are using, you could do that. And then finally, we have Nocalhost. So Nocalhost has a lot of the benefits as, of DevSpace, except there's no declarative YAML like DevSpace has. So if, when you're getting your development environment up and running, there's, it's a very click, 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 UI experience that the developers have. That's all I have to say about that one, not much. There we go. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, vote. Click yeah. a button. Click, uh, click, click. So telepresence primarily allows you to connect your application running on your laptop with something remote or from remote to your application on your laptop. They file specification with implement, uh, specification how to define what an application is uh, while developing it uh, with all those being implementation. No call calls, click, 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 click in uh, Visual Studio Code <laughs> and DevSpace, similar with the, uh, like dev file, uh, but and by, made by Loft. It's not a specification, it's just implementation <laughs> directly with no common specification. So uh, that's the thing. That's the You're thing. voting. Three, two, one. Telepresence. Okay. Uh, so, uh, telepresence. Uh, let me go back. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to do is install telepresence. Uh, install. No. Helm. Install. Uh, this will install telepresence daemon in my cluster. Come on. At one moment in time, nobody knows. Um, Maybe, maybe not. If Who knows? This is where the demo fails on an installation. Yeah, <laughs> last minute, I can say. <laughs> there we go. Not, okay, cool. <laughs> so it's installed. Now, I have here um, a very silly uh, code that calls ping. Basically, this is a code local that, will, uh, that I will use that to ping something else running remote and see whether that works with telepresence. It's again, it's a Hello World equivalent of a ping, uh, ping service. Uh, so uh, what I have in my cluster, uh, application already uh, deployed. Imagine that it's not the, the one that I'm, I'm looking at right now. So I have already application called CNCF demo uh, running in some remote cluster and I want to connect locally 
to that application, right? So telepresence uh, list uh, namespace dev. Uh, no, 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 wrong. First, I'm going to connect uh, with telepresence in uh, in uh, running in my cluster now. Uh, password. How do you know your password if it's thumb always? Okay, cool. I'm connected. It works. Uh, so now, if I say telepresence list uh, all the services running in namespace dev, uh, it says uh, ready to uh, intercept, but it's not installed. Uh, what I'm going to do is say telepresence. I want to intercept uh, CNCF demo application running in the namespace dev on port 8080, and I want to uh, store the uh, store the information about that interception in this file. There we go. Uh, now it is doing something. Uh, come on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Now, um, uh, let's see. First, uh, if I say something like HTTP, uh, HTTP uh, CNCF demo, so this domain does not exist, right? This is the name of the service. I'm treating it as if it's local uh, on port 8080. I can connect to that application. No, I forgot something. Is it dev, CNCF demo dev? Uh, yeah, 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 that's a good uh, point. Uh, is it? No, it's CNCF demo, it's uh. not dev, not dev. Okay, I messed up something. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Let me double check, let me double check. Uh, what, somebody said something? Yeah, intercept CNCF demo and SPS dev port that one and file uh, intercepting traffic. It should be. It should be. I don't know why it's not. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I know. I will blame Wi Fi in this venue. <laughs> it's blocking. Are me. you in the dev namespace? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, imagine that it worked and I have six, four minutes to fix it. I'm not going <laughs> to do that. I'm going to answer your questions if you have any. Huh? That's a very elegant way to get away from not failing at the very end. Oh, yeah.